everybody to the uh, Wednesday, April 18th, 2018 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council regular meeting. Uh, call the meeting to order and I ask you to rise for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Present. And uh, Councilor Hayes has a business commitment. Uh, will not be joining us tonight. Uh, general public comments, anything not on the agenda that anyone would like to uh, address uh, the council on? Please approach the podium. No one will close the public com comment period. Minutes of April 4 and April 11, 2018. A regular town council meeting and a special town council meeting. Can I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. Uh, any corrections or comments? No? See, none all in favor. Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. Adjustments to the agenda? Uh, none proposed. Uh, items to, to be signed uh, are the treasurer's warrants, and I have signed those. Uh, we are now on to order 18-28, public hearing and action on the new request for a massage establishment license from Robert H. Jennings, DBA Whitewater Massage, located at 183 U.S. Route 1, Unit E. And I ask the town clerk to speak to this. Uh, a new applicant. Everything is in order. We've checked the codes. Uh, he's in compliance with their office as well, and it's recommended that the license be granted. Thank you. Uh, public uh, comment on this item. Anyone wishing to address the town council on this matter, please approach the podium. Uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. No sample. No <laughs> Moving through the Moving agenda. Right welcome, welcome to Scarborough. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Jean Marie. Welcome to Scarborough is right. Uh, no further discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Old business, order uh, 1825, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 313A, the Town of Scarborough Property Tax Assistance Program, Section 5. Determination of eligibility and amount of eligibility. Subsection 2, eligibility for renters, and update of the application form. Uh, this is a second reading, so people are probably familiar with it. Uh, in doing an audit, uh, we determined that uh, people in uh, manufactured housing uh, were uh, uh, having both a tax bill for the structure and a lease for the land. Uh, and did not appreciate that, and I don't think we appreciated that, they could uh, 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 benefit from the, uh, from the program. So we're making a very small language change, which Councilor Katarina has shepherded through the uh, Ordinance Committee. Um, and so I will ask any member of the public who would like to speak to this issue, please approach the podium. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Gatterine. Yeah, I'm just very happy that uh, we are able to expand our program. Uh, for people who may not be aware, I just learned that the town of Cape Elizabeth is currently looking to copy our program uh, in Cape Elizabeth. So uh, kudos to those of us who... Uh, worked on it and supported this in the past. It's been a very successful, and I think you're going to see other municipalities uh, following our lead. The comments? Uh, it's certainly uh, 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 an expression of appreciation to uh, uh, our assessing department, who uh, identified this, brought it to our attention. Uh, uh, it was an oversight, and I'm very glad that we're going to be able to rectify it for those people. This program is significantly uh, more uh, welcoming than the state's program. We are back up over the 300 people who benefit from this program where we were before the state program shrank and shrank and shrank down to about 100 people. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this is, a, again, uh, uh, Craig Friedrich 
uh, has been of great assistance to us and the audience tonight uh, in developing and refining the program. So thank you. Councillor Bayvine. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the work and the effort that's been done because it does require a constant review and constant look at what the conditions are regarding this. Um, I do hope that um, this does not preclude us from considering further what is really necessary to expand this. You know, um, I know Councilor Katarina and I had a nice conversation this weekend about this needs to be expanded. It needs to include disabled people. It needs to include veterans. There's all kinds of criteria on, on people who need this type of assistance. So I hope that we continue looking at that um, and refining the characteristics that the law provides and that we encourage um, the legislators to also allow us to expand that as well. So I appreciate the effort that's been done. Thank you. And I think the council shares uh, Councilor Babine's uh, view on this, that while we're creeping along year to year, uh, as the uh, cost of it expands, it is as worthy a program as we have. Uh, and with taxes inevitably going up, uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, bit of a buffer against the impact of those for those in the community who are least able to uh, uh, withstand increased taxes. So, uh, I would just note that uh, I believe for expansion to other categories, uh, it may in fact mm. require some yeah. change to the neighborhood yeah. legislation. So we do need the assistance of our delegation. Yeah. Good. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. New business, order uh, 1829, first reading and refer to the planning board on the proposed Fifth Amendment to contract zone Roman numeral one or I, Frank R. Goodwin, E&F Limited Liability Company and Raymond C. Field Land Rover dealership located at 371 U.S. Route 1. Uh, this is a contract zone matter, and I'll ask the town manager to introduce it. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll just provide a couple of comments at the top. Uh, I think this council should be fairly familiar with this property and this project, uh, as there have been two uh, previous amendments in fairly close succession. Um, this is uh, considered the fifth amendment, and what I might do is just remind all of us what the process is, and if, uh, if you don't mind, I'd have Jay Chase just uh, address the, the process, just we appreciate where we start tonight and what happens hereafter. Uh, beyond that, I believe uh, we have Mr. Goodwin in the audience who will uh, address you regarding the particulars of the request. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, as Tom just mentioned, this is for the fifth proposed amendment and uh, an amended process is a little different than a, for a brand new contract zone. The process uh, really begins, as is noted on your agenda, with a first reading with council. Um, depending on the council's action tonight, should you vote in the affirmative to continue the process on, the applicant would then proceed to a preliminary site plan review with the planning board. Uh, the planning board would conduct their preliminary site plan review, make additional recommendations that would ultimately come back to the council. Council would then hold your uh, regular public hearing and second reading on the matter um, and at that point would make take your action on the contract zone proposal and again should it be approved at second reading it would go back to the planning board for fi final site plan review and approval um, where a lot of the heavy lift will be done sir during that preliminary process um, those are the steps Great. along the way any questions of yes complicated so my understanding is this is for a new parcel of land that's being purchased as well. So unless I'm misunderstanding this, would that that parcel, first of all, was it unclear to me that whether that was, first of all, if that's covered or not, if that's what we're talking about, because it looks, appears yep. as though we are. Correct. Yep, they're okay. proposing to purchase a new piece of property and maybe perhaps they already have and then expand the parking lot. Not too uh, dissimilar to what Mercedes-Benz did a few mm -hmm. years ago when they purchased the gas station. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was Sunoco that was right along Route 1 mm -hmm. and they expanded their parking lot into that area. Um, so it is still considered an amendment or a modification to the existing contract zone even though they're absorbing new property if that's the sort of line. It, it, it is. So the, the, the kind of question I have is I, I'm, I wasn't sure looking at the GIS maps whether this was a B3 zone or a Hagus Parkway zone. Um, I'm not sure where it, it kind of fell in that breakdown. Um, the, the new lot to be purchased. The new lot I believe is in the HP zone. It is? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Other questions of Mr. Chase? Dr. Rowan. <coughs> so 
th there were two designs kind of presented as, as exhibits. Uh, one was taking advantage of their existing parcel with a parking lot uh, that looks like it was smaller. And then there was another design that had kind of a larger parking lot that would uh, went into the new um, into the new lot. If they were just putting the parking lot in the, on their existing lot, would we still have to amend the contract zone if it was just a parking lot expansion? I would need to take a closer look at the contract zone language in terms of the extent of the council's approval, but I don't believe it would because it wouldn't be the council, the contract zone really stipulates around building size. The use already be permitted, I believe it would be something that could already be done through a standard site plan review process, but I sort of couch that in, I haven't dove into that details, I'm just sort of shooting from the hip based on my recollection over the last couple of meetings, but certainly know the applicants are here to sort of present their overall plan to you. Gotcha. Okay. Councilor Rowan's saying that there were two maps, two, two sketch drawings of the yeah. site plan. Uh, one had less parking and remained on uh, the lot. The other was uh, expanded into the second lot. Uh, was, was the first one uh, that remained, was that a redesign of the existing parking or was that the <coughs> in place, was that what was in place at the present time? Um, that would be a redesign, that would be an expansion. That's, that's not something that um, the town has formally received other than in this packet. Um, and so I think the applicants okay. were sh demonstrating what could be done potentially. Good. Again, Good. I know they're going to speak to that when they come to Good, and I'll, in a moment we'll recognize them as soon. Questions? Um, so I have a follow-up to Council Kiyosu's question regarding the zoning. So um, the existing parcel is HP. Um, does that pose any future problems regarding the abutting property that it mm. remains HP as far as for any type of development given what we're converting this to? Uh, when you say abutting property, if you wouldn't mind, do you well, mean I'm the abutting to vacant property? Yes. Or, uh, no, I it doesn't. That would remain in the Haggis Parkway. Essentially, this amendment, should it move forward, would encompass their total holdings um, and only apply, this contract zone would only apply to those boundaries okay. and it wouldn't. Yeah, um, the second question I have is that the, the context of the, uh, at least the information we received suggests that um, this is absolutely necessary because there's insufficient, insufficient space based upon the design plan. Um, so if we don't approve this, can, the, can their renovations and project not move forward um, as a result of if we didn't pass this? I guess I would have to defer that question to the to the applicant. At this point, they do have an approved site plan, and obviously, as yeah. you note, driving by, they're reconstructing the building as it is now. So they do have an approved site plan, an approved contract zone, and they're under con construction right now. In terms of what happens should this not move forward, I would have to defer. I, I guess the, the the primary. I mean, I'm in favor of it. Um, the primary reason is that this is the Fifth Amendment. Mm -hmm. So, at what point does the amendment stop, mm -hmm. um, and we finally have a plan? Because it seems like there's some scope creep, or in, in a way, it makes you at least look at it that way. So, I just kind of would like to understand to make sure that this is, in, in a way, maybe the final step. Uh, Councilor Baybon's question uh, raises the point uh, of uh, notice to abutting neighbors right. and neighboring properties. Uh, as to whether this would adversely impact them. Uh, I, am I correct that their notification would be received as a part of the planning board's review so that the opportunity to have their views known on this is, is going to be there? That is correct, at, true. at least as part of the planning board process, and I can't speak to the council process as the town manager and clerk sort of usher that through more. Yes. Carefully. Beyond that, the immediate butter is, is selling the property, so obviously he's aware. Uh, but nonetheless, there will be formal notifications through the planning board process. Right. Other questions of well, if I could, if, if, Mr. I don't, I don't know who to ask, but if I can follow up, I'd, I'd like to get an answer to the questions regarding is this the last amendment that's being asked? Um, you know, where are we in that process, or is this an ongoing continuation of not knowing really what this project entails. I think the only one to answer that is the applicant. I think we'll, add, we'll, we we'll recognize the applicant. Okay. Uh, if uh, uh, somebody's present here who would like to be able to uh, present information, uh, I think one thing I've, I've recognized watching these dealership contract zones go through is that everybody has a boss. Uh, some of them, are, for us, are at home. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Thankfully, uh, she doesn't watch. Others, others, others will go to work. Uh, uh, but uh, that, I think, is 
as best I could tell, was one of the driving factors here. So uh, why don't you see if you can provide us with a little bit of information. Whatever, actually, whatever information yes. you wanted to provide <laughs> before we started pouncing with questions. Sure, sure. Uh, th thanks for uh, having us here. My name is uh, Chris Goodwin with the Goodwin Motor Group, the owners of uh, Land Rover Jaguar of Scarborough. Uh, with me here today also are uh, my father, Frank Goodwin, and Paul Ostrowski with Sebago Technics, our, our technical consultant. Um, the five amendments that we've had over the years have been um, the result of, the, thankfully, the growth of the business. Um, we added a Jaguar franchise. We expanded our service shop. The recent um, previous two amendments were the result of this facility image program that Jaguar Land Rover came out with. Auto dealers are franchisees just like fast food restaurants. And so mm -hmm. our corporate overlords, when they say, hey, you need to do this, they have various ways of basically making you do that. And so the uh, renovation project that we have underway right now is that the reason why we had two bites at the apple on that is that we had a design um, that we produced in concert with the architects retained by Jaguar Land Rover to help produce their, so that everything is compliance because they have a hideously detailed list of things in compliance. If you had to build it, excuse me, from scratch, it would be really, really difficult. So they put something together for us. We went forward with that after looking at it and thinking about it further. We realized it was going to have problems with the operations of the dealership and that it really just wasn't going to work. So we then had to go back and seek approval for yet another amendment to allow us a little bit more square footage in the building that would allow our operations to work. So I know that that's something that you look at and you kind of cock your eyebrow at, and, and, I, and I get that, but that um, one of them really nothing was ever done with, so that there was one for the renovation, and now we're here for um, the parking. Um, as I, I said in my cover letter, um, Parking and space on site are um, a real constraint to the operation of our, our business. Um, right now on the lot, we've got 93 sites. We've averaged around um, 100 new and used, uh, no, 120 new and used units in our inventory at any given time. Obviously, some fairly simple math says that there's not enough space to store them on site so that we've actually had to store units off site. Um, the construction has really exacerbated the problem so that we've gone into high gear trying to find solutions and the obvious solution was the parcel immediately behind the property, an undeveloped parcel in a, a subdivision, in a, a portion of the subdivision that hadn't been developed at all so that it seemed like a fairly logical place for, for us to go in, in that regard. Um, with regard to the two plans, I apologize if it, if it generated any confusion. My intent was to show that yes, we own this land and we could expand the parking in this manner. My feeling and my hope is that um, you would agree that it, it would not be enough um, to really kind of get us over the top on the extra space. Any extra space is great, but that the extra space with the um, neighboring subdivision lot that we're proposing to purchase would really make a big difference. That would provide us with enough space so that we could store all of our inventory on site. We could um, source service vehicles that are being worked on. We could have employee and customer parking so that there would be enough space for everything there. We wouldn't need to be shuttling back and forth between different areas, which is really, it's not good for our employees. It's really probably not good for the public. I mean, it's just, it's not something, if you can avoid doing that, I think everyone would agree it would be a good thing. Um, and this parking is really pretty essential to, to get us there. Um, with regard to the overall scope of the amendment process, I would be uh, very hesitant to give you an ironclad promise that this is the last amendment we'll ever seek. Um, again, the amendments we've sought thus far have been the product of growth of the business, which is something we're really thankful for. Um, if the business continued to grow such that we ever had a, a, a need or a want for, for something different, we'd want to come in and talk to you about it. For our immediate purposes, once the renovation is done and if we were to be able to get this parking lot, I think I can state fairly confidently that that would be the last you'd hear from us for, for quite a while. Um, I think that's sort of the basics from my perspective. If anybody has any, any questions or anything that I can shed light on, please please feel free to shoot. Uh, Councilors, any questions? Very good. Good, thank you. Uh, members of the public, uh, uh, anyone wishing to comment on this matter, please approach the podium. Uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Council Gazer. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm not thrilled with this. This is why I hate contract zoning, to be honest with you. I do not want Route 1 Scarborough to start looking like Route 1 in Saco. Um, I, I appreciate that they're a victim of their own success. 
um, but it seems like it, it strikes me as ironic that we continuously make uh, a, amendments to the contract zone to allow for more square footage, but in, in return results in less parking, <coughs> which in turn drives more square footage requirements. So um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not going to hold it up. Uh, they're a successful business. They've been a good a good steward in mm -hmm. Scarborough. However, I would expect from the from staff or the planning board, uh, I would like to see a comparison of the requirements of the HP zone versus the contract zone in terms of what's allowable for that um, and what kind of setbacks we'd be looking at and permeable surfaces and all of that other stuff. Because quite frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned uh, that this is going to expand and expand and expand. Um, I, I applaud them for their successful business model, but as I said, I, I don't want to have auto mile route one in Scarborough. So I'll support the first round, but I would expect a lot more, uh, hopefully some more information back from staff or planning board before we move to second. Comments further? Councilor Bailey. Um, uh, couldn't concur more than what Councilor Chiazzo mentioned, but I do think that at least the placement of the additional space behind the primary lot is actually appealing, no differently than when the planning board took up Sullivan Tire and whether or not that should have been elongated across all of Route 1 and what it would have looked like versus what it looks like now where it goes literally backwards um, and is somewhat what I would call hidden. So I at least appreciate the fact that it's not really along Route 1 but um, in the back of that. So I, I concur with his comments, but um, I at least appreciate um, the design where it goes um, to the back of the, back of the property. Um, so I think I'm actually in concurrence with both of these gentlemen uh, on their comments and, and feelings about it. Um, my concern was answered uh, uh, through your, you know, explanation of why having to come back. I, I always worry about, uh, you know, time and resources. We just approved, you know, just went through this process with the planning board in, this year. So, um, you know. Uh, be mindful of that uh, in the future. So uh, I'm happy to, I'm not going to hold it up. I'm happy to let it, the planning board do their work. Um, but I, and I do appreciate the, the fact that the parking's going to be behind versus, so in that regard, it's a little different from the look of and feel of Saco. So thank you. Yeah, and I was, I was just going to add, I, I feel like um, uh, given the placement of this parking, I have less concern about this particular contract zone amendment than I do about the uh, proposed. Um, uh, contract zone that we were just discussing, contract zone three, over on the corner of um, Haggis and uh, uh, Payne Road. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't have any concerns with, with this, really. I mean, I take the point about the expansion and, and the, the desire to avoid uh, a Route 1 auto mile in Saco, I mean, Scarborough. Uh, but I'm not sure this, this uh, takes us significantly closer. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Kettering? Uh, might as well weigh in. <laughs> um, I, I would concur with what I've heard from my fellow councilors. My, when I first saw this, and I saw this was the fifth change to our the contract zone, uh, I'm like, what, uh, come on. Um, and I, I do understand the car business. Um, my dad was a financed car dealerships for years, so I get it. You know, the corporate guys or gals tell you, you know, you got to do this, that, and the other thing in order to move the cars. But, um, and maybe it's a, a bigger issue for the town to be looking at. But that being said, I, I when I looked, delved more deeply into this, I too was pleased to see the parking was behind and not in front. Again, because uh, the Miracle Mile there on Saco was pretty ugly, in my opinion, but who am I? Well, that's it. Good, thank you. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with Councilor Cazzo's uh, remarks. I had, had, I had been uh, assuaged of concerns by the parking being in the rear. I thought that was, uh, it will not materially change the Route 1 appearance. However, uh, because it's a part of the HP zone, I think understanding how those work and the planning department will uh, conduct that kind of analysis make sure that the abutters who own the property back there are not being inadvertently prejudiced by this because it might represent something different than they had for an expectation. Uh, but I expect our planning department, our planning board will give this a good review and uh, come back with a recommendation to us. So uh, further comments? I just want to be clear. I, I believe the way a contract zone works, the, the current zone, which is HP, goes away. The, the purpose right. of the contract right. zone. Um, and so 
can you articulate what your concerns are so we can make sure we can yeah, yeah, respond my, to them? My concern is that we will we'll exceed things like uh, permeable surface with a contract zone versus with an HP zone. That we'd have, you know, because it's a parking lot, you're going to have, with a contract zone, we can set anything we want in essence, right? Uh, where the HP zone has certain restrictions to it and the amount of permeable surface setbacks, things like that. I'd like to see how this plan would be impacted by the restrictions mm -hmm. of the HP zone exactly. versus a contract zone. We can set anything we want for the contract zone. Mm -hmm. So I just want to see the differences in the impact, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Further comment? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Order 18-30, uh, first reading and refer to the planning board on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the Town of Scarborough Main Section Roman numeral 6 definitions and Section Roman numeral 17B, Hagus Parkway District, HP permitted uses, conventional and planned developments. I'd ask the planning director, Jay Chase, to introduce this for us. Thank you. Hello again. <coughs> Uh, so yes, this, these uh, proposed zoning amendments are coming to you through uh, the Planning Department and SEDCO staff. Uh, we've worked um, collaboratively on this effort and we've actually uh, brought this forward to the Long Range Planning Committee at their last meeting in April and they uh, were recommending uh, consideration, favorable consideration moving forward. Um, basically this, this is coming forward because our between Karen and myself, we've been experienced increased interest in development of so-called flex space in town. These type of uses are defined in our ordinance as uh, research, develop, uh, development light industrial, high technology facilities, small batch processing facilities, and the like. Types of activities um, that are typically allowed in the Highest Parkway, the B3, um, and proposed in the crossroads, and some are already allowed in the crossroads. Um, these are projects that are designed sort of with a, a mix of areas under one roof. There's office space, there's showroom retail, there's the um, uh, production and assembly areas, and then there's the areas for storage of the materials and goods that are actually produced on site. Um, and that's really where, where the crux of the question comes. So within the Highest Parkway, we've had a number of questions from folks about the ability of users to store their materials or finished products on the site, so those things that they're actually producing. And this pertains to the existing ordinance language under the stated permitted uses in the uh, Highest Parkway. And it's in more particular number 10, it's around warehousing and wholesale distribution accessory to and located in the same building with a permitted principal use provided that the floor area of the warehousing and wholesale distribution does not exceed 50% of the floor area of the principal use. Essentially what this language creates is a, a limitation on the storage of goods in the Highest Parkway zone, which is not otherwise uh, um, uh, required in other <coughs> districts that allow the same type of activities. It, uh, essentially the um, storage of goods <coughs> other zones that allow these same activities is considered sort of an accessory use and is something that's really looked at through the planning board review process, again, as I said, as an accessory use. Um, but this language in the Highest Parkway makes it very clear that it's, it's only permitted up to 50% of the floor area, sort of an arbitrary number, so to speak, whereas through the planning board review process in other zones, they really look at it as what's the principal activity on site? What's, what's really occurring? Are you making items or are you storing goods, much like doing warehousing? That's really more identified as an industrial use. That's, um, you know, uh, where you typically expect, expect a lot of heavy truck traffic, not a lot of jobs being created. It's sort of just warehousing of space as we normally would think about it. So uh, as we thought about the language um, and, and discussed the issue with the Long Range Planning Committee, they felt that really the highest parkway should be treated equally as the other zones and consideration of eliminating that language um, should be brought forth. Uh, another item as we have been dealing with the, uh, sort of dealing with the issues, we recognize that warehousing and distribution are permitted uses in the industrial and light industrial district. And again, this is now 
where that is the principal activity. There's a building whose sole purpose and activity is for storage of goods, trucks bring the goods there, and then take them away. There's really no production assembly, maker space, might be a small office space to deal with the warehousing, but that's really the principal activity. Uh, but the, the, those activities aren't actually defined which also led to some of this confusion. Um, so there's proposal to add definitions for warehousing and storage and uh, distribution. Um, and so, the, and that would help clarify any future confusion and make it clear that sort of accessory storage, ancillary storage of goods and materials that are, are again, accessory, ancillary to another principal use are allowed. Again, that would be something the planning board would deal with through their review process. So. Those are the changes. Questions of Mr. Chase? Councilor Rowland. Yeah, um, so then I just, I just want to restate what I, what I think I heard, and that is that we're, by removing the language of the permitted use to say that, uh, to, to not specify that only 50%, essentially we're allowing the no restriction. It could be up to 100%, could be distribution and, where, and warehousing, as long as there is, that's the secondary or the ancillary use of the property. So it couldn't be 100% in the Haigas Parkway because then that would be the principal use. It, so it needs to be, so the planning board will sort of, through its due diligence, figure out what is the principal, what's the driving activity on the site? Is it the maker space? Because different products require a different amount of storage space. If you make something small, you don't need a whole lot of storage space. If you make something large, you need more storage space, but your impacts may ultimately be the same in that you have a lot of office workers, you have the production room, you have the retail showroom area, and then you have this other, the storage of all that stuff. So again, that's, that's the due diligence that the staff would do, the planning board would do to sort of, to really determine what is the driving use on this site and is that storage, again, secondary and ancillary. So in the Haigas Parkway, one could not establish, at least the way this is, uh, just a warehousing or distribution building. Those are only be allowed still in the industrial, the light industrial district as they are today. Gosh, if I can follow up. Oh. Yes, follow up and then yeah, so council vote. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, the uh, then can you could you speak at all? Presumably that was understood at the time that this was written. I mean, could you could you speak at all to the intent? Originally, is there like a higher yeah, so you know I, standard for this zone? I yes, there there are some higher standards, and I, I did try to go back into the history and look at when warehousing and and distribution language was added, and, and it came in very early in the Haigas Parkway. And my assumption, and you know, we're going back before my time, is that. It was really around concerns around truck traffic, that if, if it wasn't, um, uh, you know, if these activities, if it wasn't clearly stipulated that only 50% of the building could be utilized, that you may have creep into additional warehousing and storage activities that could become the principal driver of the site. Um, but, you know, that's sort of conjecture on my, on my part. May, may well be that the prior planning director just didn't have the vision that our president <laughs> oh, At least you wow. said it while he was in the room. I, do wow. think it's superseded. I, I believe it superseded even the prior. <laughs> wow. uh, I don't know how to come after that. <laughs> um, so my eyes tend to glaze over when I start getting into uh, a lot of this language. Yeah, this and so nuanced. I just want to boil it down for my myself yep. uh, real simple the goal is truly just it's greater flexibility to allow to attract a wider array of use uh, uses so potential folks who will want to be there right perfect thank you further questions of mr. chase yep. uh, I don't know whether the uh, developer wants to uh, supplement those or whether we go right to public comment so just for clarity, this is a staff initiation. This isn't. This is separate from the crossroads uh, development. Good. Um, so, good. so this is staffs. Good. Very this good. This is staffs bringing this forward. Good. Soon um, you'll hear from them. I just Thank killed you. it. <laughs> yeah. uh, public uh, comment on this matter. Good evening, Larry Harpel, Nine Period and Drive. Um, I've spoken on behalf of development in this town. Um, at the planning board on a um, Jiffy Lube on Route 1. I spoke in favor of the accurate dealership and also the 
uh, luxury apartment houses that are being built in my neighborhood. Um, I think there was some foresight by having the 50% limitation there. As I said, it's not like other districts, nor is the Hagus Parkway. It is one of our gateway uh, to Scarborough, and we've been very sensitive to what we do in our gateways. This, this council has, the planning board has. 50% um, seems to me to be a large amount of space, and that once you get beyond that, you really have a warehouse. And a warehouse belongs in an industrial park, a uh, and not on, on, on a, a, um, a gateway street here. Uh, so I don't, I think that was the whole idea. We want to have high value properties. It's a high, there's a lot of visibility there. You stick a warehouse where? Where do you find them? In, in industrial parks in any and all towns in Maine. I've got a question on the, uh, the two definitions here that are the two words, distribution and the warehouse and storage. The warehousing and storage definition has distribution as part of its definition. So it seems like we've got tomato and tomato here. A warehousing, it says a structure building with materials are stored specifically for distribution to other sites or locations and distribute the distribution <coughs> uh, one says basically the same thing. So I don't see how we divide that one up. But I would, but the key thing is I hope that we, we leave the 50% in there. That seems like it was a smart thing to do and it is a gateway and there's plenty of places that are that aren't prime. We can't replace that that uh, those sites. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? See none. Close public comment. Mr. Chase, can you answer the question that was just posed uh, about the warehousing distribution? The definition question, or yes, the yeah. definition. Yeah. Um, so, as I said, sort of distribution and warehousing and storage are uses that are already uh, stated, permitted uses in our industrial and light industrial um, zones. So that's sort of why we're defining those now. And essentially the definitions uh, reviewed, um, you know, uh, a number of local zoning ordinances as well as sort of professional publications on the matter and, and these were the ones that we found. I think, you know, in terms of, you know, having the term definition, uh, sorry, uh, distribution in the warehousing and storage definition. I, I think it's, to me, it's about, you know, warehousing and storage talks about it being a structure or a building where materials are stored, but the, typically they're not just going to be stored, they're also going to be moved at some point, so we could potentially look to change out the word distribution if that's a, a concern, or um, uh, I, I guess I didn't have much of a concern with it myself, but if others do, we can certainly take well, a, another look at it. Yeah, it's certainly true that in defined, defined terms are often used within the body of another defined term. And it's given the meaning that it is defined as in the ordinance when it, when it appears in another section, another defined term. So I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with that. that that's, that's not uncommon. Questions? Uh, no, no questions, but I, I might be able to shed a little bit of light on this. The, the Long Range Planning Committee chewed on this a little bit. Um, and, you know, we were looking at the definitions basically from a bigger picture. Warehousing being the sole usage of the facility is like a storage facility or a, uh, you know, a, a, a place where the, there's no office spaces or per se mm. or no uh, assembly areas or anything like that. Literally trucks come in, they dump stuff off, and they divide that load to different places. That's kind of a distribution center versus a warehouse, like a storage facility or something. The distribution center, the distribution portion of this was, was really centered around um, uh, uh, companies that have, let's say, like an engineering company that does production. Let's say we've got a, a situation, we have offices in the front, um, or production offices or staff offices or whatever. You may have a showroom that has a certain number of square footage, but you're also doing, you're bringing in product, uh, you might be modifying and assembling it and sending it back out, and 50% seemed like a little bit restrictive for usage similar to that. So I think the, the, the concern in the long-range planning was more the, the form of the buildings. We wanted to avoid the, the view of the 
you know, you see the classic industrial building where you see the row of offices in the front and this giant facility behind it that's just a, you know, windowless structure. Uh, I think that was addressed fairly well and the planning board will be looking at that form and function and it will have to conform with the regular requirements within the HP zone in terms of what that structure would look like. So it's really just kind of an expansion of the utilization of uh, a, a, a client or an office or, or, or a company that would be doing multiple uses on site, that 50% storage was seemed like it would be a little bit restrictive for some of the development that was sought. Is that fair? Is that Absolutely. And okay. I was actually just going to say, I, I, as part of that conversation, I think the same building that uh, Councillor Babon brought up before was raised was right. the Sullivan Tire building, right. it, mm. being a good example. That mm. There are still design standards, very high design standards in the Haggis Parkway. Um, and so. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Uh, public comment is concluded. Uh, I'll accept a motion. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, all set. All set wrong. Yeah. So, uh, looking at the definitions, I don't. I don't have a problem with uh, using the term distribution in the definition of warehousing and storage because um, it doesn't create a circular definition. It's it's still linear. Um, I do understand the, the point that. Um, um, Mr. Harwell was making, um, but I'm, I'm also concerned about the the relaxing of the um, the standard in in this zone. I I, I feel like uh, you know we, we could have you know filled this thing up with warehousing and distribution, uh, given its location. That that were were we willing to relax our standards ten years ago, we could have you know had this thing build out. Um, and so I, I guess I have some concern now about um, relaxing those standards. I mean, I, I think I, I take the point and I understand the reason behind it, but I'm, I'm definitely concerned about, uh, about it. I think that the 50% the may not be the right number per se, but it at least provides a target um, and, and some, kind of, um, some kind of restriction to say that not only do we have higher uh, standards in this zone, this is, this is an example of it. Other comments? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I understand the councilor's concern. I, I think warehousing is, a, is an applicable use in this zone, um, and we do have to rely on the planning board to kind of determine, I mean, it could be 100% warehousing. It is a, a viable use here. Um, I believe it is still, uh, it is not, I'm sorry, that's right, correct, it's not. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, you know, when the discussions are on the planning board, we're really more along the lines of uh, the form function of it and and what it would look like and again the Sullivan tire I think was a good example there's other things going on in the building not just solely warehousing and distribution there's offices in the front there's a showroom you know there's there's a repair facility or a repair bay but they obviously have to store things so I, I just you know we looked at it and thought the 50% if it restricted certain industries that we weren't aware of um, that 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 was a, a concern that that would encourage growth in that area a little bit better so I, I don't think we're going to run into a situation where you're going to have, you know, a, a person who has, you know, a, a desk and a chair in there, and 99% of the rest of the facility is a warehouse, and they're going to say it's a mixed use. I, I think the planning board's going to be able to address that, and and deal with that. The, uh, uh, I guess the question is, where does the protection come from that's raised by uh, Councilor Rowan's question? Is it site plan review? Uh, Councillor Chase or Setco Executive Director? Got promoted, oh, Councillor yeah. Chase. <laughs> Councilor. Congratulations. Yes. We have a ninth councillor now. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, it's coming Karen Martin, Skyway Economic Development Corporation. Um, I just want to address one piece of this, which is um, really a subtle difference between, if you will, uh, storage and warehousing. I think when Jay and I were looking at this, we were looking at companies that were actually doing value added at the site and they had storage of their own product as opposed to something that might be 100% warehousing and maybe the only thing that it is doing is having um, storage of products, whether it's their own products or not. But this was definitely um, to address companies like uh, Horizon Solutions who when Horizon Solutions came in, it was very regimented about, all right, well, you can't do more than 50% um, storage, 
but they had office and they had some retail, they had other pieces. And in this economy, I think people um, need that flexibility to perhaps um, go a little bit back and forth on how they use their space, and this was really part of that accommodation. And what we also realized is that certainly with um, Highgast Parkway, it does come with the stronger design standards, so it's going to prevent a low value um, warehousing coming into the coming into the site. Um, but Jay can certainly address um, what happens at site plan. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. Well, good. No, I think that was very satisfactory, Councilor Foley. Um, I guess I you know I, I hear. Councilor Rowan's concerns, but every conversation I've ever been a part of uh, regarding things coming into Haggis Par Parkway, um, I feel very confident that those design standards would be in place. Nobody wants to see it look like an industrial park, uh, mm -hmm. and we have been very patient for 20 years uh, and, or more, and uh, I, I feel confident that the <coughs> planning board would put anything to come through through its due diligence, and um, I, I trust that process. So. I hear your concern, but uh, it's, I'm happy to support it. Further comments? Yeah. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, order 18-31, first reading and refer to the planning board on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the town of Scarborough uh, as presented. Uh, and I would ask, uh, are we going to have, uh, Jay, are you going to introduce this or is Dan? Uh, I, <clears throat> I can do a very quick introduction if you'd like. Um, Good. Just to sort of set the stage, if you will, in terms of process, I think a number of the things the council is about to hear tonight were uh, presented to you at a workshop previously, um, or at least, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> discussed. Um, the applicants have, been be would have met with the Long Range Planning Committee at least twice to discuss these issues. Long Ridge Planning Committee did their due diligence, asked for a couple of changes, made some recommendations in terms of tweaks, and at this point, um, I can uh, let the council know that the Long Ridge Planning Committee would recommend the suite of uh, proposed changes that are being, uh, that will be presented to you here shortly. Um, and again, I can sort of speak to that process, but I think, again, we'll let the applicant. No, thank you, that's a good introduction. Uh, Dan Bacon, on behalf of uh, the developer, uh, can perhaps give us a little more information on the proposed changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan Bacon with Coral Palmer. I'm joined by Rocky Rizbera, on behalf of Crossroads Holdings, LLC. Um, it's good to be before you, I appreciate it. Um, we've, been, we've been busy. Um, we've been working on the overall master plan for, the, for Scarborough Downs in the Crossroads District and the design process, working really closely with the planning board, work through um, the master plan for the first phase of development proposed on the southerly end of the property um, as a as a mixed residential phase to the project, both with a memory care facility and, and potentially some light commercial uh, coming along after. And um, we remain, remain kind of laser focused on the goals of the crossroads, really kind of creating that mixed use community that the comprehensive plan calls for, but also the zoning calls for. And um, at the same time, we've, we've been talking to a lot of people and talking to a number of boards. We've went to the SEDCO board. Um, like I said, the planning board, we've been meeting with the Long Range Planning Committee. We've been working through conversations with our brokers and really getting our heads around um, what is the right balance of uses on this property? What's the, what's the market demand? Um, what's the right balance of uses for the property um, and kind of the right zoning structure to make sure it's successful and make sure it's kind of really equally balanced in terms of residential, commercial, recreation. We're thinking a lot about recreational uses and also open space and, and making sure it's not a project that's weighted heavily in one direction or another. Um, so that's a bit of the backdrop in terms of why we're before you this evening because um, the zone is 
served us well uh, in our conversation with the planning board. It's, it has a lot of flexibility, but also gives the planning board significant control. I think more control than uh, any zone in town from a master planning standpoint to ensure that this project is planned well and, and master planned before um, you get into the, we get into details in terms of design. So as we work through this process, we've discovered some things that we think um, and have coordinated with the Long Range Planning Committee, as um, Mr. Chase indicated, on some things that we think kind of deserve tweaking to go back to achieve those, that, those balance goals that, that we think make sense for the development team, but also make a lot of sense for the community um, as this project rolls out. So there's essentially five kind of categories or, or different amendments that we want to present to you this evening. Um, one is a zoning map change. And I have that to present first, but it's actually out of order in terms of your order numbers, um, because there's two orders that you're considering tonight, the, the next two. So if you don't mind me kind of sticking with the presentation, and then we can have discussion when you want it on, on the map change versus That's the other fine. things. Um, so jumping into the, to the zoning map amendment, um, when the zone was created, uh, it was pretty deliberate in terms of following the property lines of um, the Scarborough Downs property with the exception of Highgate Parkway and really kind of three fingers that connect to the, the abutting roads, one at Sawyer Road and two at um, Route 1. But when uh, the Risberas and the Crossroads Holding LLC bought the property and did additional deed research, it turns out the property lines aren't what the prior owner or the assessor thought they were. <laughs> so Surprise. this map amendment um, actually is in large part to, uh, to rezone to follow the boundaries of the property, which was the original intent in most areas of the property. Um, if you're looking up at the up at the map from your seats, the, the orange is the current boundaries of the Crossroads District. And then, it may be hard to see, but the red dashes are the current boundaries of the property. So, um, to the east, there's a 25 to 30 acre piece that actually kind of juts uh, towards 114. It doesn't go nearly to 114 because there's Warren Woods. There's land trust property right there. Um, but that property, that aspect of the property wasn't truly known at the time the zoning was established. So we're, in, ex and in other areas, there's some land that was thought to, to go with the property that actually isn't owned by the property. So this map amendment um, by and large is, is trying to, to write that um, and have the zone follow the property lines with four exceptions. Um, like I mentioned before, deliberately there are these three fingers of the zone that were left in the current <coughs> zoning or the adjacent zoning I should say. Uh, one to Sawyer Road and two to Route 1. We're not proposing to include that in this zoning map change. Um, those make sense <coughs> to kind of stay with the existing zoning. And they're narrow, they're narrow slivers of land that aren't developable from a, at least from a building standpoint. So we're not proposing to include <coughs> those, two, those two fingers. We are proposing to include um, the aspect of the property that abuts Highest Parkway. So that's an area of the property that um, at the time it, number one, it was thought to have a lot more development potential. Um, earlier wetland mapping suggested that there was a lot more land on Highest Parkway that was developable, particularly on this property. Um, and there, with our wetland analysis, there, there really isn't. There's in the kind of 10 to 12 acres of upland, which is a lot different than originally anticipated by the prior owners in prior kind of town discussions around the zoning where it was thought to be you know, 30 or so acres of development potential. Um, so we're proposing to, to fold in that area into the Crossroads District um, 
really because what we want to do with this project and what we've been talking to the planning board about is to design it in an in a integrated way. We want the road systems all to be integrated. We want uh, development to be integrated to the extent possible, recognizing there's some natural resources we want to you know, um, conserve and buffer. And that, that's what the district is all about. And so we felt that it was important and to the goals of the comprehensive plan and the zoning to have the entire land holdings be zoned consistently for that, for master planning reasons, for being planned, integrated, and interconnected. Um, so this is, the second map shows the adjustments. Um, and I realize there's, goes up to the letter G in terms of what those adjustments are. Um, but it's showing what would go in to the Crossroads District because it wasn't priorly mapped as Crossroads. So that would primarily be A and B. Those are the bigger areas that would go in. Um, and then the other, by and large, the other areas are really kind of fine tuning the actual property line and the zoning line to make them match. Um, they're not large land areas that are being, in, this, in many cases, subtracted out um, so that the property lines match the zoning line. So uh, that's the kind of first request before you. It's actually the second order on your, on your agenda. Um, I'm pleased to talk about these individually or go through the presentation and then come back to anyone, however you'd like uh, to proceed. Uh, certainly would accept uh, uh, dealing with this first. Uh, and then we'll deal with the uh, uh, order 1831 uh, second. So uh, is there any objection to proceeding no. that manner? So what we are doing is we're dealing with uh, order 1832, which is a first reading referred to the planning board, the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map, which uh, Mr. Bacon has just uh, described. Um, and if you've concluded with that, I'll ask for public comment. I just have one more note before, you, um, before you take that next step. As part of our conversation with the Long Beach Planning Committee, um, and I think we want to be clear in terms of who's bringing this forward. We talked about this with the Long Beach Planning Committee, where this is a request by Crossroad Holdings, LLC, mm -hmm. to make these amendments um, at the advice of um, staff we wanted to work closely with the Long Beach Planning Committee on getting their feedback, their input, their direction on the changes to, to shape this proposal, um, to get their input um, and have it you know, coordinate with the town zoning. So we've taken that step and had the two meetings that Jay indicated. Um, and one of the things that they recommended that we've done is to reach out to property owners near where the more significant changes are being made. Um, so we've done that in two different ways. On the, um, I'll call it the A side, so the side facing Warren Woods, um, we've sent letters to those abutters um, in part because they're not necessarily, there's not homes there, so they're not residences of those properties. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't have a way to contact them more directly than that. Um, we actually have a meeting scheduled with the land trust um, for next Thursday. Um, we're going to talk much more than about just the zoning changes, but they're aware of this proposal. We're going to be talking at a higher level about coordination, you know, open space, trails, things that um, are of importance to them and, and us in terms of that design. So we've conducted outreach to that side of the property. Um, we've also reached out to more of the kind of commercial property owners on Haggis Parkway. So we reached out to Linwood Higgins as a landowner, uh, adjacent um, David Miley owns Enterprise Business Park. So we've reached out uh, to him. And we're in the process of reaching out to Glenn Grant. The Grant family owns the property to the north. Um, so I want to mention just that outreach that before the public comment period is, has occurred to the extent that we could since our Long Beach Planning Committee meeting. Any questions of Mr. Bacon? Councilor Rowan. Um, in the master plan, do you, can you speak to any intended use of the, the parcel that's labeled B on, on the screen or, or what, just kind of what the intent is there for what that might be used for? Right. Um, we've looked at it, uh, and there's uh, 
there's a piece of upland that basically goes from between Haggis Parkway towards, um, there's a stream that kind of divides that area from what I would call kind of the core, where the, where the grandstands are in the, in the parking, et cetera. Um, and it's, you know, in the eight to 10 acres range of size, we're thinking that is a likely a um, commercial or mixed commercial with maybe some multifamily type housing, uh, but primarily a, a commercial use. And then there's some land that is um, less contiguous. It's like smaller uplands that is more conducive to, to maybe townhouse or kind of uh, lower density residential. So um, that's, and that kind of goes towards the south, towards Enterprise Business Park. And we see some opportunity for, from a planning standpoint of trying to actually interconnect with Enterprise Business Park ultimately um, in that area. And, I, and it's our understanding Enterprise Business Park is thinking about maybe having a mixed use or some multifamily housing at some point in that area of the project. So we think there's some um, good interconnection that could occur there and some symmetry with what could happen uh, on this parcel and theirs. And um, so that's where we're at right now. And then to, to the best of your recollection, is that consistent with uses that would be permitted under Haggis as well? I would say that the it is but for certain residential uses. So Haggis Parkway allows uh, a range of commercial uses that we talked a little bit about earlier this evening. Um, and it does allow kind of multifamily type residential if it's mixed with a commercial um, or through a contract zoning, just multifamily, which the bind is doing. But so a townhouse or say duplexes or I would say lower density or fewer units per building wouldn't be allowed in the Angus Parkway district. Thank you. Other questions? Comes and gives them. So I've, I've asked this before and I, 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 I kind of remember the answer to it already, but how, how <clears throat> Fixed and firm are the property boundary lines now. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I mean, are we looking at? I mean, we might have a couple of acres here and there. I'm sure that are, uh, but are we fairly locked in at this point? Yes. Okay. okay. The questions of uh, Mr. Okay. Bacon. <clears throat> uh, certainly, I think uh, Council Rowan's question about whether the integrity of the uh, Tegas Parkway zone <coughs> is at all compromised by uh, rezoning that area that is contiguous to it is something I think that uh, all the council would have as a question, so. Good, uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to address the council on this matter? Uh, this is the zoning map. Accept a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Comment, Council Gazo. Yeah, I, I, we'll get into the uses, I think, in a little bit. Uh, it makes sense from, a, from a, a, a utilization standpoint and an administration standpoint to have one contiguous zone through the whole property. Um, I, I, we, we, when we get into the next order, I think you'll, you'll, you'll hear some of, the, some of the recommendations from long-range planning that were, were accepted, but um, I, I, I think uh, it, it were, which were accepted in terms of alleviating some of the concerns of usage and, and how that's going to blend in. So uh, it makes sense to me from a map change, um, rather than have multiple zones and have to work with three different approaches or multiple different approaches, um, the intent of the CPD zone was to encourage development in that area. I think it should be within the property boundaries. I mean, it just makes, makes uh, administrative sense for sure. Thank you, Councilor Gaza. Councilor Kevin, excuse me. I was going to say, we look alike, you know. No. <laughs> um, just so for the purpose of the audience and for the council, um, this has been through long range planning. We had really good, robust discussions around this. And as Councilor Kayaz uh, mentioned, um, this just makes perfect sense. And it's not unusual with parcel purchases like this, boundary lines are, aren't what you think they are until you get them surveyed. Um, so I think it just makes it for an ease of planning down the line, both for the developer and for the town. Um, it makes, to me, it makes perfect sense to do what they're suggesting here. And it has been fully vetted by long range planning, so. Thank you. 
both Councillor Cazo and Katarina uh, sit on long-range planning, so that gives us the opportunity to have these fully vetted. Some other questions, comments? So my question is, sorry, we, we the issues on the table now. Right, we're in discussion. Yes. Uh, the uh, my question is around just kind of a, pro a process perspective. So my concern, it all makes sense to me. Um, my and again, my only concern was what I alluded to with my question was around, you know, if we take that parcel denoted here by B, take it out of the Haggis zone and put it into the crossroads zone. What have we done to the to the Haggis zone? Uh, is that something that the planning board would discuss? I mean, are they the ones that would compare those two zones and say, or is that really? That's kind of long-range planning would have done that and it has made the recommendation that this is appropriate and has now passed it to us. Okay. Good. I think that. Thank you. Comforting to know that that's going to come back to us with some evaluation. Other questions, comments before we vote? Seeing none. Uh, motions ready for vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bacon, you want to pick up uh, order 18-31, first reading, refer to the planning board on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the town of Scarborough, as presented. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so this is the kind of the second primary request and or the one that, well, it certainly warranted the most, most discussion in Long Beach Planning Committee, I think, and it's the one that um, we think is the most important to the project kind of moving forward, especially in the short term. Um, and that's a request to add some additional uses to the district, but with significant controls and performance standards. And those uses are um, additional non-residential uses along the lines of manufacturing, uh, assembly, research, uh, light industrial, uh, food processing, like food industry, brewing, um, really more kind of employment-based um, light industrial uses, but not heavy industrial uses or all things industrial. We've been fairly specific in our conversations with the Long Beach Planning Committee and specific in our own deliberations around um, really enabling an area that can create a contemporary technology park um, type of economic development area. And this kind of goes back to my earlier comment about kind of the right balance and mix of land uses for a property of this size. And um, right now, there's a wide range of residential uses that are allowed from single family up to kind of multifamily and senior type housing. And there's a fairly wide range of commercial uses. Um, but it's absent, absent the kind of more of the manufacturing technology um, tech and, and related uses. So we're recommending this um, and requesting this really as, as we, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it actually is in the comprehensive plan for this district. Um, in the 2006 comprehensive plan, it, it included the notion of more industrial type uses. We're actually asking for fewer of the uses that the comp plan recommended uh, at the time. And um, so that's um, particularly notable that at the time, this area was contemplated to have uh, this mixture of uses. We're also requesting it um, because there's, there's significant market demand in Scarborough and in Greater Portland, and there's essentially no inventory for for these types of uses, for manufacturers, for flex space, for uh, technology space that um, that wants to go, wants new sites, wants new development. I think right now there's a two percent inventory in the town of Scarborough, um, and I think it's actually lower in Greater Portland. I think it's one and a quarter, um, but you know less than two percent. Uh, I, I can safely say. And so there's demand. And there's also significant benefit. These are the types of uses that um, generate high tax revenue. There's low service demands, and I think the town's working on an ROI, you know, analysis that that can confirm that in terms of present day. Um, but when the town conducted I think, a growth and services report quite some time ago, I think Councilor Babon has probably participated in that. Through manufacturing and 
these types of uses, not trucking and terminals and warehousing like um, Mr. Chase was talking about earlier, but kind of manufacturing, technology, et cetera, light industrial uses that have people and have valuable equipment or um, a fair amount of activity have, have a high tax yield and really low kind of demand on town services. So we see significant kind of tax revenue benefits for it for the community. We also see it as an important stimulus to the project um, early on. And we want to do that in a way that's an asset to the project in the town, not a detriment. So we've thought a lot about, OK, how do we build this in the project so that it's fitting and compatible and in some ways kind of tucked away, if you will. Um, and up on the screen, and it's probably hard to see the details of, but that's showing the top left corner shows the overall map of the district. And it shows up towards Payne Road is the area that we think is, is really suitable for this type of technology park. Or we talked about the term innovation park, but we, um, I think we, we you know, still want to noodle that. But that's, that's the intent of this type of area. And we see the Payne Road areas as being really appropriate for it. Um, in terms of it being close to the Turnpike, it's, it's close to regional transportation routes. Um, and, and can really kind of, there aren't residential abutters um, along Payne Road. It's zone B3. There's actually, a, I think there's a salvage yard next door, uh, for better or for worse. And um, there's, so it, from, a, from a compatibility standpoint, we think it makes a lot of sense. And in the zoning proposal, and working with the Long Beach Planning Committee, we came up with specific performance standards. Um, three of the most important are buffers to adjacent residential zones, which is the current 100 foot no disturb buffer requirement that is in the district. And it's also what's expected of other similar zones in, in town when there's that kind of interface between um, non-residential and residential. We're also including a 250 foot buffer to Payne Road and to the Downs Road coming in. Because we don't want the Downs Road coming off of Payne Road to be an industrial gateway. We want to be a gateway into potentially a active mixed use center into residential neighborhoods, into all the things that are going to exist and we hope to exist in, in the rest of the project. So this isn't to be the front door of Payne Road. It's to be accessible to Payne Road, but tucked, um, tucked away so that it um, can have good, again, good accessibility, um, but not be the, the front door. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've included a and this is a quick slide that we've done some modeling in terms of um, you know, how this could lay out, how it could fit the landscape. Um, and so this is just a first crack at that in terms of showing some mixed manufacturing light industrial uses and, and still having the same kind of framework with the rest of the project. We still want it to be walkable. We still want it to be fairly uh, integrated and, and not um, in the 80s industrial park that's just sort of spread out and totally auto and truck oriented. We want to try to integrate these high value uses in a way that's somewhere in between sort of a walkable town center and that, and that kind of typical layout. Um, so this is our first kind of cut at that and some example uses above. Um, but what I was going to say in terms of location um, in addition to the, the buffering requirements, we've established a, a location within the project and limitations within the project. So it is confined to that, to that northern quadrant by Payne Road. There's a maximum distance off of uh, the Payne Road shown here. And then, then this map is, is illustrating really the maximum extent of where these uses could happen. We've done this in a way not to suggest this whole area is going to be this way, but to avoid coming back to you <laughs> in the future should we get the exact location kind of wrong up front. Um, because 
We don't know every little detail about this quadrant of the property. Right now we want to buffer away from wetlands. We want to um, enable, you know, maybe it needs to be closer to Payne Road, maybe it needs to come down from Payne Road to leave more land to the east in another use. So we wanted to provide a framework and sort of an outer limit recognizing the planning board through master planning has the ultimate control of kind of regulating us on the details. Can I ask a question? So, Dan, I just want to be clear, what is the limitation for that creep toward the corner, uh, the core? Is it the 1,400 feet on Downs Road? <coughs> it's that coupled with this, this map would be included would be. Okay. In, the, in the district. And we need to work with okay. planning staff on where they want it in the, in the zoning ordinance. But this would be in a, in a, an exhibit, if you will in the zone. Okay. Um, so that, I'm sort of saying high level with it, but that's really the, the gist <coughs> of this request. There's a few other um, uses that I, that I wouldn't consider as being manufacturing technology that we thought were fitting in the project and are compatible. Um, they include contractors' office in space. Uh, we think that there's high demand for that generally in Scarborough. There's also going to be demand for that within the project to kind of serve the project. Um, and we think it's not incompatible with the uses that we're talking about. There's also, we included um, sort of an auto repair type use. And that's actually for a somewhat different reason um, in that Right now, there's very limited places that they can go in the community. Um, and they, there are some, some located, say, on Route 1 that maybe don't want to be on Route 1, or there are higher, better location, there are higher, better uses for them today on Route 1, and providing some ability for them to move to new locations in, in the community, uh, we think is of value. So I don't anticipate this is going to be Auto Repair Alley, but it's, um, a use that we thought was important to include so that some that say are in other parts of town have a place to look <coughs> that maybe they, they no longer need to be. Um, and there's also a provision for some amount of storage just given, uh, and it's not warehousing or distribution, but it's really a storage for residential property owners and businesses that need storage space that, that may be within the project. Um, the last slide I have, and then I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, is we showed this at another um, couple other meetings, and I thought it was relevant to this conversation in that this shows the more or less the outline of the downs in three different communities. One is Freeport, one is Mashpee Commons in Cape Cod, and one is um, the peninsula in Portland. And we're not trying to necessarily replicate uh, any of these three, but it's really showing kind of the scale of the scale of the property and the different types of land uses that can fit within it in a harmonious way. Um, we try not to scare people by showing the Portland Peninsula, but I think it's an interesting one to look at in terms of all the things that are on the Portland Peninsula in terms of land uses and context in the Bayside, which is in a sense, what we're talking about with this zone change, you know, contemporary um, mixed use light industrial or manufacturing in that type of environment fits within, you know, that area. And you go a couple blocks and you have Whole Foods and you go a couple blocks and you have Congress Street. So, again, not the same density, but a sense of we think with good design. Um, compatibility can happen on the site and it can do a lot of different things for the town in a way that we're all going to be proud of in 15 or 20 years. So um, that's the point of the slide, just to kind of give a sense of scale. Good questions of Mr. Bacon. Councilor Kazin. Uh, Dan, can you um, focus in a little bit on the on the, the, the highest part, the B there, and maybe to, to address some of Councilor Rowan's concerns on where what part of that parcel is really kind of developable and what part isn't? Because I think that was important for the long-range planning group to hear as well to, uh, to alleviate some of those. I know you're not focusing on that now on the northern half of it, but um, there is a reference in there to the setbacks and how they are, oh, yeah. uh, they are larger in that area. So maybe you could address that. Sure. Please. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and sort of wrapped into the zoning map change to a degree is trying to be consistent where uh, this district is uh, abutting other zones in terms of how uh, how the frontage needs to be treated. So since the crossroads district could come out to Haggis Parkway, we want to duplicate the standards of the Haggis Parkway in terms of a landscape buffer. It's been important to the town to have a 25 foot kind of landscape buffer down Haggis Parkway. Unless we included a 25 foot landscape buffer in crossroads, that wouldn't necessarily be required when you change the map to add it to uh, that area. So we've been deliberate about doing that uh, on Heights Parkway, but also on Payne Road and Route 1. On both of those streets, the adjacent zones require a 15-foot landscape buffer. So we're including that same standard in where this site abuts Payne Road and Route 1. So it's consistent. Other questions of Mr. Megan? Councilor Rowan. Yeah, could you speak at all? I, I believe in our packet there's also something about earthwork uh, extraction and construction activities. Is, is that something you could just speak to? Yeah. I was... <laughs> oh, oh, I see. You're, I was doing just you're, the, you're, you're the uh, manufacturing, separate. but mm -hmm. I can go right through and you guys can... Uh, it's up to you how I... Nope, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll hold till we till we get there. I just thought it was all part of the same action. That's well, it, wrap it, up. it is all it part is. of the yep. same. So, uh, no, I think you, probably you should go through. continue yeah. and yeah. finish. Oh, yeah. Um, unless other people have questions about what we just, sure. I didn't mean to move it along. I, I didn't realize that. It is one order, so I didn't mean to yeah. break it up too much. So No, if, unless there are other questions about the section we just, he, Dan just covered, I think we could move to the next term. elements of the zone changes yeah. that you're proposing. Um, the other, another element that we've talked to the Long Range Planning Committee about, and it's very targeted, is a proposal to allow for um, gas stations only at the Payne Road end of the site, much more actually limited than what we just talked about with the other uses. Um, like the town has done in, in other cases with gas stations, there's very tight controls around where they go. Um, and so we've really kind of modeled after that and said, on this 510 acre site, we believe the only suitable location or proper location, at least for our development scheme and, and um, for how it interacts with the surrounding roads is up at Payne Road. Where there's close to the highway, it's, um, we anticipate ultimately a fair amount of traffic coming in out of the project. Um, there could be some destinations for people coming from um, other communities certainly and other uh, parts of the region. And we think it could be an asset to the project <coughs> and also just kind of users of the site. Um, so we're proposing that within a thousand feet of the Payne Homes Downs Road intersection, um, that gas stations be allowed and that they be subject to all the typical performance standards that are, they're subject to anywhere else in the community. Um, there's a similar standard near exit 42 and that's how the Irving uh, went in a handful of years ago because it was in, within a certain distance of uh, that intersection. Um, and so this illustrates kind of what that, that area could be. And then the other I think two components are the one that was brought up in terms of kind of construction activity, earthwork. Um, this is a, a really big site that's not uh, typical of a, obviously not similar to typical development. But, but generally, uh, under the town's current regulations, uh, a development can happen and earthwork, material storage, is like, it's incidental to the development activity. Um, and the planning board kind of looks at that if they're gonna be doing a water feature. You know, if they're gonna excavate to create a stormwater pond or a water feature, that's part of the, the, the site plan. Um, if they're gonna be storing material on site, they can do that kind of for the life of the development. And then when they're done, it's, you know, it, it's removed and the, and the project's complete. With this project, it's, it's gonna be phased over a number of years. Um, and we wanna be responsible about how construction activity happens on the site. Um, and we're thinking about how best to kind of minimize impacts to the surrounding road system in terms of trucking, um, how best to 
manage construction in terms of hours of operation so that it's not disturbing maybe new residents in the project or neighbors and abutters to the project. Um, and you know, what can occur on the site and where? Um, so there's significant kind of material on the site that we think that can be used to implement the project. And we'd want to do it in a way that positions the project for success down the road. So if there's a part of the site where we know that there's going to be a stormwater pond or a water feature, but it's not part of the phase that construction's actually happening, um, that's a location where material can come from and then it be restored and be ready for development when it's ripe. So, and that would be, that's allowed uh, under current ordinances, but we wanted sort of a roadmap for us and the planning board to follow in terms of kind of meeting those expectations. So that's in the, it's in the proposal as performance standards so that the planning board has kind of guidance and we have guidance on how that happens and then um, that can be approved as, as part of a certain phase of the development. So that's the, in a sense, um, that section. And then the last section I touched on a little bit uh, with Councilor Chiazzo brought it up, and that's around kind of being consistent with other zones, um, buffers to the streets, I guess Parkway, Payne Road, and Route 1. Um, and the other part of that is right now there's a required 100-foot no disturb buffer to residential districts from development in this project. And there's a 50-foot no disturb buffer from commercial districts uh, for this project. We are in full support of the 100-foot buffer to residential um, zones. We understand it and thinks it, think it makes sense to buffer a project from, from, those, um, from those areas. Um, and in our current case, we're actually buffering residential in the first phase to a piece of conservation land. We're not in love with that, but we understand the intent um, and, and, we'll, and we are not proposing any change to that. What is a challenge uh, in the design process is this, this 50-foot buffer to commercial zones. Um, and I mentioned earlier the goal of trying to integrate with the Enterprise Business Park. And right now, um, it's challenging to kind of integrate with the Enterprise Business Park because we're required to have this 50-foot buffer. They don't have any buffer to the Crossroads District because it's a commercial zone to a commercial zone. They don't require to do anything. The parking is right up to the property line uh, in a few cases. So what we're asking for here is in the spirit of interconnections and kind of integrating with commercial uh, where we abut it. We don't abut it in a lot of places, but where we abut it, um, we're seeking the, the removal of that 50 foot no disturb buffer to provide sort of more of the, the integrated approach in terms of design. The planning board still through master plan has the ability to kind of regulate it. If there's uses that need buffering, then I'm sure they're gonna require it. Um, and, but we think that it's kind of counterproductive in that regard. Um, so that's the, that's the other change that we're, we're seeking. So I think that summarizes the amendments. I'm happy to answer questions. But other questions for Mr. Bacon? Good, thank you, Dan. Uh, public comment, anyone wishing to address this matter, uh, please approach the podium. Is over here on this end of the table. Um, I think there's a lot of good things in this proposal tonight. It covers a lot of ground, certainly. Um, and it's well thought out. It's certainly anything to do with the site as far as reducing truck traffic and so forth and using resources there is, is all to the good for, for, the, for the development and for the community. Um, we talked about this or it's been discussed as a town center. And that's that's evokes certain images. Uh, tonight, um, it was mentioned technology park, manufacturing park, innovation park, um, all evoking certain positive images. The, I'll speak to the gas station as as a start. 
Uh, we have two stations now, one on either end of the Hagus Parkway. Um, the one out on, on Payne Road to the entrance to Scarborough Downs is four tenths of a mile. You can see from the current gas station the traffic light in that uh, location. So it's only four tenths of a mile from there. Uh, going north from there, uh, there's a Cumberland Farms filling station. It's 1.1 miles plus uh, Sam's Club. So we've got gas stations to serve those areas. Um, talk about um, mini warehouses and storage facilities. I don't see that in my concept of a technology park or a town center. Um, uh, speaking of storage facilities, there's going to be one built right next to uh, Crossroads on Route 1 here. A prompt in, um, what is it, Enterprise Park? Yeah. Um, speaking about contractor shops, uh, contractor offices, shops, and storage yards, storage yards don't denote something of high value to me. Um, motor vehicle and service facilities, including auto body shops. Um, I suppose Mr. Moody could move his shop in there. Um, uh, facilities for repairing RV uh, vehicles would be a similar, uh, similar situation. Sale, rental, and service of heavy equipment or specialized motor vehicles. Well, I think of Milton Machine and, and uh, the heavy equipment they have, they certainly could move in there. Um, and I'm not disparaging either one of those companies. It's just this, this vision of, of the town center and innovative park, it just seems to go against that. Um, but, uh, and so those are my, my observations. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Seeing none, close it. Uh, ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Yeah, I guess I'll just start off with, you know, again, long-range planning really chewed on this pretty hard. Um, we, we, we had a very lengthy discussion about setbacks and utilization and <clears throat> buffering with districts around it. Um, I, I think a, a, it was a very uh, good discussion, and I think it wasn't, it wasn't just uh, a this is the way that it is. It was a good give and take, and there were adjustments made to the proposal based on those discussions. So. Um, I think uh, I think what we have in front of us is is a, an opportunity to encourage development the way that we want. The the there were concerns about how do we regulate or how do we put stopgap measures in, and I think the planning board process for master planning uh, plays a big role in that. So even the things that we have here, they still have to go in front of planning board review. We're talking about kind of isolated pods right now. But as future pods come into play, uh, they're still going to have that check and balance system of going through the planning board and having to, having to review that in master planning. So uh, I think a lot of the concerns that were brought up in long range planning, or all the concerns, I should say, that were brought up in long range planning were addressed. Um, and I, I can support the changes that were that are put forward. Katarina. I um, obviously, being part of long range planning, I was part of the discussions. I had concerns about some of the buffering. Um, and setbacks, but we had, as, as Chris said, we had great discussions on that. One of my big concerns was the original writing of the uh, mineral extraction, um, and they've tightened it up considerably, and to me now it makes sense, you know, given uh, what I know they need to do uh, for construction. Um, so I, the other thing that I, I really like about this, I know it seems potentially to some people overly broad perhaps, but you need to remember that the planning board is going to be reviewing everything along all, all of the steps all along the way. And I'd hate to see what happened with Haggis Parkway because, you know, that was so narrowly uh, constructed when it first started that that's part of the reason I think that it, it never went anywhere, one of the many reasons. So I think the more flexible we can be, um, our, our technology, our, our ways of doing business, our ways of transportation, everything are changing rapidly. And my assumption is in 20 or 30 years, you know, you're going to see even more changes. So being able to uh, have some flexibility within this development makes perfect sense to me. So. Thank you. 
Occasionally, you have something else? Yeah, and I, I, I probably should have mentioned too the earthwork issue came up uh, pretty extensively as well. The concern was, you know, wh are you going to have just piles of aggregate kicking around right. for 15, 20 years or so? Um, I, I think it was addressed very well in that. Um, that's, a no that's normal for a development. It, this isn't an abnormal development right. because of the size and the duration of it. Um, but as, as the full development starts to wind down and you start finishing up the full development of the project, there's a mechanism in place for the planning board to go back in and say, okay, uh, now that you're now that you're tapering off, or we're only we're on the last pot or something, the, the planning board will could institute and say, okay, all the aggregate piles and all this stuff, they're no longer necessary for development. Those have to be removed as well. So, so it's not a permanent fixture. I think some of the concerns were that it was going to be a quarry, or there was going to be, you know, it was going to be a storage site for construction materials for everybody else. I, and I believe, and correct me, Mr. Chase, if I'm wrong. It's, you're not allowed to bring materials in from outside and store them if they're not product project related, and everything that's stored on site has to either come from within the project or be trucked in specifically for that project. So it, there's not going to be a whole lot of trucking back and forth and used for storage for other projects. Things, and I, I believe that's correct. So Mr. Chase is nodding. So I, I think that's that's uh, that that alleviated a lot of the alleviated a lot yeah. of the concerns in the long range planning committee as well. Thank you, Councilor Foley. Um, I certainly hear. Uh, Mr. Hartwell's concerns, when you hear uh, about you know an innovation park, right, it doesn't conjure up the images that you immediately think of when you th when you start to think about town center. But I think when you consider where they very carefully place that over and above and tucked away, it's certainly not going to be the highlight of this development. So we have to balance that growth <coughs> with some economic development to offset uh, taxes, which we all care about greatly. Um, the only thing that gave me pause really at all was the gas station. <laughs> uh, and again, for the reason was there is, you know, there's a pretty substantial uh, station right at each end of, of Haggis. So I guess I, I would want to learn a little bit more, uh, perhaps about why that specific request uh, in that area, because it just it seems a little overkill to me. But um, in general, uh, thank you for the thorough update. Oh, uh, so I guess I would concur with uh, uh, the first part of Councilor Foley's statement around uh, not not necessarily having a problem with the the uses as described by Mr. Hartwell, given that they're kind of tucked away and in that in that isolated area. Um, but I don't have a problem with with putting a filling station uh, there on on uh, Payne Road. There's one down the street and there's one up the street. Um, I think commercially. They, you know, whoever's developing that would consider, you know, the use and the, the busyness of the the expected use of that of that station before they would put it in. But, um, but I don't think it's inappropriate there on on Payne Road. Um, uh, in general, I, I I feel like this was all really thoughtfully worked out, and I appreciate the work that was put into to bringing this together. Councilor Beba, uh, thank you. Um, so. Um, the great part of being in this job is that you can rely on experts like the planning board to take care of things that might not necessarily be uh, your background, and so I rely very heavily on them because zoning is not one of my, my fortes. But I will suggest that um, having been here when the parkway was initially planned and developed is that we also can't sit in hindsight and question um, what we initially wanted versus where we need to go because the economy is extremely different. Um, when that was originally planned, what we talked about was that it was going to be a mecca for health care. That was the growth of what was happening at that time and why a lot of uh, new businesses came to Scarborough, including the Medical Center at the old Kmart um, and what's along Route 1. So um, it's very different, and I think that we need to remain flexible, and I think the recommendations um, continue us on that path. Um, I do have, uh, you know, no differently than we don't want um, the parkway to be um, the auto mile. We also don't want it to be that stretch of Route 1 in Saco that has nothing but a fast food restaurant or a convenience store. And I don't think that that's necessarily what's going to happen with these changes. Um, while we might have some concerns, I, I really do um, depend heavily on the planning board's oversight and the planning department. And I think this is going to move forward very positively. <coughs> Yeah, I share your confidence in the planning department and the planning board uh, uh, and the long range planning's uh, involvement in this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think the comments relating to town center uh, uh, are the kind of things that anyone would raise when they start to hear about an industrial setting. But when you understand how large this property is 
and where the industrial activity is targeted to take place and limited to, you understand that there is a considerable distance between it and where the town center will be. This is 500 acres, and so there, there's many neighborhoods expected in this, and the town center and this uh, uh, light industrial section really are not uh, going to mix uh, based on, on the geography. The uh, gas station is a concern uh, uh, because we have an entranceway at, hey, at uh, uh, Payne Road, and so I was wondering, Dan, if you could address, uh, would, is that going to have a material effect? We all know what exit 42 looks like, and we've now started to think in terms of uh, a, uh, a car dealership there would be an upgrade to exit 42 intersection. So you can see that, that perhaps the gas station at, at exit 42 is not perceived as that great an introduction to Scarborough. So uh, I think we're all interested in to know a little bit more about the gas station and what kind of aesthetic effect it would have on that end of the entrance to Scarborough Downs. Yeah, we've talked um, a bit about it. Um, you know, we <coughs> want to get ahead of ourselves in terms of designing it without it being an allowed use. Um, but some things come to mind. One is that you know, is there consideration for it not being at the corner? But there's a fair amount of pain road frontage. Um, so it potentially doesn't need to be that corner fixture. It could be um, shifted uh, towards, I'd say, the, I guess it's the northeast. Uh, so there's potential of, if it is actually on pain road, um, it not being uh, the, the primary feature of the corner and the gateway. Um, we also have uh, the commercial design standards um, that provide very specific direction on a lot of different commercial uses, particularly gas stations in terms of orientation and, and aesthetics and what's in front, what's behind. Um, the planning board has the ability to dictate that the pumps not be the primary feature. Uh, it hasn't always been the case based on past reviews and site constraints, things like that. But there's a lot of, back to your comment about planning board control and master planning, there's not just the master plan, that's a, that's, there's the commercial design standard process. Um, <coughs> we also have a lot of, I think, um, I wish I could say that I was the primary architect of this design, but it's Nick Osito who is the designer on this project. and. Um, We've been kind of thrilled to work with him on a lot of these things and figuring out the right gateways in the landscaping and um, what the treatments are. So I think a lot can be done in terms of boulevard coming in and landscaping that, that doesn't make um, the gas station seem like that's the primary feature. Um, and so, I mean, I think that a lot, there's a lot of things that can, can help uh, soften that depending on location and design. Is, is my point. If you remain there, oh, it's, it's actually not a question. I was just okay. continue on. Okay, thank you, Dan. Councilor Rowe. Uh, so, my point on the gas station uh, was just that they're, they're somewhat of necessary evil if we're really going to develop 500 acres here. I think there's going to be a need for a filling station at some point. And the other thing to note is that the, the gas station that Mr. Hartwell pointed out is four tenths of a mile away is pretty inconvenient if you're gonna go north on, on uh, Payne Road, the Payne Road. Um, so I, I think that having one on that side of the street wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Casa One of the things we were kicking around too, just to, not to beat the dead horse, but uh, it's a filling station now, maybe it needs to be a charging station in 15 years. So, you know, we're not looking at just immediate uses. We've got to yeah. keep in mind longer term vision and, and you know, what, what it's hard for us to, to determine the needs in the next 15 or 20 years. But um, I, I think the infrastructure is important for sure. And, and I think that probably you're hearing that Payne Road entrance is obviously one of three major entrance ways. Uh, but at the same time, functionality uh, is important and we appreciate that. So. Uh, being able to address those those issues will be uh, a challenge. So, are there, are there comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay.
that takes us to item eight. Yes. Uh, Non-action items, none. Uh, standing and special committee reports and later to reports. Uh, let's start with Councilor Kazan. Uh, so long range planning, Matt, you heard what we talked about. It's everything that was presented tonight, so you need to really recap that. Um, unfortunately, I missed the energy committee meeting this morning, um, and I would make a request to staff again mm -hmm. if I could, because um, I'm, unfortunately I got the invitation, but it was on my Chromebook, and it wasn't on the town website calendar. So unfortunately, I, I didn't check the Chromebook until I got to work, and it's an early morning meeting, and I missed it. So my apologies on that one. But if we could do a, a maybe a, a better effort to get all the committees up there and, and agendas posted and stuff, that would be certainly helpful to me. Thank you. We'll work on that. And that's it. Thank you. Councilor Kettery. Uh, yeah, ordinance will be meeting tomorrow at 4.30. We're going to speak um, <coughs> continuing on the odor. Um, uh, Assistant Town Manager Crockett prepared some thoughts for us to, to look at. Um, Moorings. <coughs> Continue that uh, discussion, and then um, there was a request um, to address just some minor issues, but it's with parking right in front of the Scarborough Beach entrance. And I have a solution, hopefully, that the police departments come up with that I Good. think should work. Um, communications met, where we talked about moving to a quarterly meeting um, because we see ourselves at this point as being an oversight as opposed to directing and you know, doing everything with communications. Um, I will, uh, I did send out, a, I guess I'll call it the polished up or edited version of what we worked on. Um, so that you should have that. Let's plan to meet May very briefly. I put it, I've emailed it to you, Sean. But anyway, talk to me mm -hmm. after. Um, and we will um, just finish that up and go from there. And then the seniors met yesterday, again talking about, you know, input of the comprehensive plan, age friendly, uh, which is an, a thing that AARP is doing. And a lot of towns around us are becoming designated age friendly. And the Senior Expo is May 2nd at St. Max's from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's really cool, you know, for any seniors or even if you're not senior, come on and see what services are available for seniors around um, the greater Portland area. There's a lot of freebies there, a lot of free candy, pens, you know, tchotchkes and whatever, but good information. So that's uh, May 2nd, St. Max is 8 to 2. That's it. I'm sorry, uh, The Conservation Committee met. They're, they continue to noodle around which uh, projects they hope to tackle this year. It didn't really come to any uh, formal conclusions uh, about that. Um, Think I'm getting confused now because of all the extra meetings we've had. The <laughs> Eastern Trail uh, uh, Lions Gala was a huge success. Uh, I can't remember if I shared with that or not, but uh, they raised over twelve thousand uh, dollars, and uh, a good time was had by all. Uh, the next big kind of fundraiser for them will be the uh, John K uh, Andrews 5K, uh, held in partnership with O'Reilly Secure, um, and that's it. Thank you, Councilor Owen. Um, so the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee did not meet, but we had a special meeting here at uh, Town Hall um, to talk about the um, Beechridge Schoolhouse with some of its members. Um, uh, Mr. Hall was able to attend. Um, we also had uh, two members of the Beechridge Community Club um, and two representatives of the uh, Scarborough Historic Society. Um, and I, I've discussed this property with all of you in the past. <coughs> Um, but we're, we're, we're continuing to bring it forward because uh, a resolution hasn't really been found yet in terms of what we're going to do about it. What was discussed at this meeting was um, uh, the possibility of the community clu club turning it over to the historic society uh, <coughs> to own the building. Uh, but there's still a fair amount of repair that needs to be done in order to keep this building um, standing and, and sound. Um, and so uh, that we're actively, some of the member, pe folks that were there are actively soliciting bids on some of the things that need to be done. There's some f foundation work um, and some roofing. And so I will be bringing it um, as something for you all to consider as part of the fiscal year 19 budget. Um, so I'm going to talk to all of you on the finance committee, uh, everyone in general, and, and Councillor Hayes as well to bring them up to speed on kind of where that. Uh, what that is and, and what it entails, and it's something to consider. Um, this is a 
you know, a building that served as uh, first through eighth grade uh, in a single room um, up until 1947, um, at which time uh, folks started busing down to the um, Dunstan, I believe. Um, and then they would go on to high school over at, um, at Bessie. And so there are still folks in town that are, um, that went to school there. Um, and it was also, uh, when it was turned over in 1948 to the community club, um, at that point there was no electricity in, in Western Scarborough. And so that, that club was really integral in getting uh, electricity brought to, um, to Western Scarborough, much, much then as now, you know, a lot of attention is paid to the Route 1 corridor. Um, but um, that, uh, that group was really instrumental in the development and, and uh, the progress that's been made out there. Um, you know, and in the, that facility has been used over the you know, intervening half century of, as a meeting space. Um, various uh, clubs have used it, um, but the, the folks that are, have been taking care of it are, have really kind of aged out. Um, and the, the community has really changed over that half century. And so we're, we're kind of looking for solutions to kind of preserve the, uh, the building as well as continue to make use of it. Because if it just becomes a static museum, the concern is that, you know, what's the value? We might as well take a picture and just let it, let it rot. Um, so the, the, there's still a lot of um, uh, conversation about the, the future of it. And I just wanted to prepare you all for the, uh, the fiscal request that I'm going to be making in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Vega. Let's see, uh, library, uh, they, not, they haven't met since the last meeting, so I, I know that they give thanks for the uh, workshop that we had. They do meet tomorrow night, so I'll be able to report better at the next meeting. I um, did want to mention, even though Peter is not here for finance as our chair, we did have a finance committee meeting last evening. Went very well. Um, we actually reviewed the budgets for uh, uh, finance and assessing, as well as to the planning department, and then fire and police. Our next meeting is the 26th. Um, and that will be actually in a different format. It will actually be a joint workshop between the town council's finance committee and the uh, school board's finance committee. So it's in a workshop format that we've conducted over the past several years as a joint venture with them. So it is a little bit different, um, but it allows us uh, to have an open conversation. And of course, the review is the school's budget. Um, I did want to mention that tomorrow um, at 10 a.m. is the um, Neighborhood Budget Forum. It is at, um, at the Public Library. I believe, uh, I know I'm definitely will be there helping present. Uh, the manager will be there. And I think my school board partner is Carrie Lightford. Um, correct, yes. Right? Um, and so Ms. Lightford will be there as well. So that's tomorrow at 10. So um, with that, um, what was it? There was one other item. <coughs> that was it. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, I uh, attended in Peter's stead the Finance Committee uh, and got railroaded into chairing it. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe it, it was, was a democratic process, no, Councilor. Not railroaded, <laughs> nominated. Uh, uh, but it was an enjoyable experience as uh, uh, it was a very thoughtful presentation. In fact, the, the budgets that were presented uh, assessing finance police department, fire department, very responsible and uh, had obviously the firm hand of our town manager on presenting responsible budgeting. I just want you to know that it was pretty obvious to me that there are some wants, but they're not going to necessarily be fulfilled because we've got some standards that we're applying to ourselves, some goals, uh, and I think that was quite appropriate. Um, Town Manager's report. Yes, uh, I see Councilor Chiazzo pulled out the budget schedule. I just want to correct. Uh, I was just thinking that. Mind. I believe next Thursday is the final department budget review, and then Sorry. the joint meeting yes. is on May 8th. Okay. Um, Sorry. Beyond that, and, and speaking of the neighborhood uh, budget meetings, uh, I know Councilor Foley <coughs> attended a meeting last night at Hillcrest, as was mentioned. We have another one tomorrow. We do have two more reserved, and uh, okay. we're making efforts to actually hold those, so there'll be a total of six, ideally. Uh, it's really dependent on availability and elected officials um, to be able to fill those spots. I yes. know for a fact I'm doing Monday 23rd at North Scarborough with um, Mary Star. Mary Star, 
Okay. She's on vacation right now, so I've been able to confirm, but yeah. I do have another school board member. As so soon we'll as, definitely do As soon as we confirm those, we'll certainly publicize those to make sure um, yeah. uh, people are aware of them. Generally speaking, we've had 20 to 25 people attend, and so I think everyone, uh, and I'll certainly let you have your own comments, but, but all, all the feedback uh, I've received in my own participation, they seem well worth it. Uh, they're Good. generally an hour and a half or two, sometimes longer. Um, and uh, the intent of that is to really talk about what's on the minds of the uh, attendees. So I appreciate everyone's uh, effort. That does seem to be a success. A couple of other points of interest. Uh, the town did sponsor uh, an application for this round of CDBG financing through Cumberland County. Uh, this is for the Habitat for Humanity project and it is for their final course of paving. Uh, we've received notice that uh, that has been recommended to the commissioners for approval and it will be considered next week. We're very hopeful that that will get funded. A uh, reminder to council, uh, you're all invi invited to the Scarborough Community Chamber Municipal Officials Dinner, Wednesday, May 9 at uh, Atria, which is the healthcare facility here in Oak Hill. Uh, they are looking for you to respond if you'll be in attendance. Um, Tony and I can circulate, uh, recirculate this invitation if you if you missed it. Uh, with respect to the public safety billing, things are moving, you know, very briskly. Uh, things are, are happening. Seems like every week at this point, uh, we have made application to Army Corps of Engineers and DEP, which is a real critical matter. That's almost uh, the most important of all of it. It's kind of open ended, so. Uh, we are certain we'll have our design process uh, well complete and we'll likely be waiting for those final permits. Uh, that process does require a public hearing, uh, or I should say DEP has suggested we have one and we think that's a good idea. Uh, so we arranged that for next Wednesday. That's a busy night in town. There's a lot of other things going on, but uh, we had to make it work within uh, the constraints of that process. You may have noticed on your way in this evening, we have some modest bathroom renovations. I assure you, we are not doing projects uh, out of budget. Uh, we had some water damage and some potential mold situation, so it's an insurance claim uh, being taken care of, and we expect those bathrooms will be back functional uh, by the end of next week. And I think that's it. I'm available for questions if you have any. Any questions of the town manager? When is the hearing, the DEP hearing next Wednesday? When, when and where? It's at the Public Safety Building in the conference room oh, or the gotcha. uh, training room uh, at 6 p.m. Gotcha. And what time is our hearing? 6. six. It's also at 6. Uh, Councilor comments. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just a couple. Um, first, uh, and it's always sad to mention uh, local uh, 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 community members who have passed away, but there's been several in the past several weeks that I think deserve mentioning. First is I, I wanted to give condolences to the Lothrop family. Robert Lothrop, Lothrop was a local f uh, fisherman, lobsterman, served on the council, I believe, for three terms back in the late 70s and early 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, was a wonderful person um, and so I, and a member of the fire department family as well, I believe, uh, for many, many years. So I want to give condolences there. Um, and then, um, I, as I called him, um, I gave him a promotion every once in a while whenever I'd see him. He went from being the mayor of Piper Shores to the governor of Piper Shores, and that's Merton Henry. Uh, Merton was a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, I remember one day when he um, actually asked me why I wasn't a Republican, I told him that my eyes um, opened up, and he said, I hope that you have a nice visit to the eye doctor the next time you uh, go. Um, but I get, uh, he, was, he was an incredible person, just a true gentleman across the board and a wonderful activ activist. He's the one that really started the public forums down at Piper Shores that allowed us to really be integrated with that community, and so uh, to his family as well. And then um, even though it's not really close to home, but um, if you didn't know him, uh, John O'Brien used to go by in the name Jack. Um, yeah. Jack was actually the um, uh, Register of Deeds for Cumberland County for 14 years, a big Democrat, uh, came out of retirement and actually served two terms as the judge of probate as well. And um, just a wonderful, wonderful man. And so um, just wanted to uh, give him and his family um, some recognition as well because um, he um, does a lot of work, especially for Scarborough as we've grown. Last is that um, I just wanted to make sure that it's known. I know that counselors are aware of this. Uh, next Wednesday is our public hearing um, regarding uh, the recall effort and uh, the setting of the date. Um, it is my intent to be here. However, I may be tardy. Um, I am actually um, on vacation with my wife, and um, I have learned over the 20 years that I've served is that a happy wife is a happy life. 
and um, I'm giving her priority for that vacation and we'll be in Florida for the uh, week up until Wednesday. Um, I am landing right at 5.30 and plan on uh, boot scooting it as quickly as I can. But I really hope that my tardiness, um, and maybe absence, because I am going through D.C., and you never know what happens through D.C., um, that it's not neither um, a sign of either being complicit or tolerant of the circumstances of what we're dealing with, but very, um, 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 very concerned, and I do um, share an opinion in that. But at the same time, I do hope also is that um, – you know, um, a lot of words have been shared and a lot of words have been said. And for some reason, as counselors, um, we are being, um, in essence, uh, pressured, if not bullied, into not making a statement. And I hope people understand is that we are citizens and we do have an opinion. That's why we serve, because we have an opinion. And I hope that people are both um, accepting of that, as long as we are um, uh, polite and generous and also um, uh, uh, reflective of our position as well as our um, status as a regular citizen and I hope that people understand that um, I will not be bullied into not sharing my opinion it's happening and um, I recently received an email and I will not be bullied by any counselor and I will not be bullied by any citizen in not sharing my opinion so with that I thank you Councillor Rowan I have nothing tonight thank you Councillor Foley um, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to Larissa Crockett and Leanne, and I'm going to butcher the last name, but I, Casalonius, Casalonius, yes. okay, uh, for being my partners in crime last night at the budget forum. It was, I was nervous about it because the budget is not something that I would call myself an expert in by any stretch of the imagination. And, um, but we had uh, a lot of varying viewpoints in the room and really healthy discussion. Uh, so that felt really positive and good. Councilor Kerry. Uh, believe it or not, I don't have any comments. <laughs> it's okay. Councilor Kerry. I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, I need a moment to recover there. Um, I'll keep mine very brief. Um, I, I, uh, our company has a location in Madison, Wisconsin, and I just want to say how grateful I was to be living in Maine because they have, I believe, seven inches of snow <laughs> as of today. Uh, so um, I'm glad spring is here and um, looking forward to some nice weather and and uh, not put taking the snowblower out anymore so thank you uh, I, I wanted to send out condolences to John Beltre and his family his beloved wife Marilyn Beltre uh, a Higgins Beach resident and uh, a wonderful person uh, and really liked uh, loved by many other people in the Higgins Beach community passed away this week um, this Sunday, uh, the library is having its charging station uh, uh, ribbon cutting and an event from noon to three, ribbon cutting at one. Uh, the, uh, uh, I did my uh, budget committee meeting that we had this week. Uh, uh, it was uh, enjoyable because I got a good sense of some community concerns. Uh, it was long, two and a half hours. <clears throat> and held it <clears throat> at Wentworth, which is such a terrific facility. Uh, but uh, Larissa Crockett did an excellent job. I want to commend her on, on the job uh, of the superintendent. Julie Kuchenberg was there. She always uh, is very responsive in the questions, the answers that she gives to every imaginable question. And we had about 20, 25 people there, so there were some faces that we hadn't uh, seen before, so that's always uh, good. Um, next Wednesday uh, is a special town council meeting. We're meeting, I think, every Wednesday in April. <laughs> uh, uh, a public hearing on the recall petition is going to start at 6 p.m. Uh, last Wednesday, we had a workshop uh, to educate us on tax incentive financing agreements called TIFs. Uh, uh, I am excited about the prospect. Uh, of this vis-a-vis -vis this massive project called Scarborough Downs. Uh, uh, these uh, vehicles can be used to create opportunities for the town that are simply not available without such a partnership. Uh, uh, some people shy away from them because they are concerned that it might be a giveaway to a developer, but uh, this council, I think, to a person is committed 
to uh, uh, looking after the interests of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I know that the Scarborough Downs people view this the same way, and they're excited about the prospect of entering into discussions with us about that. And I think that uh, from the education that we received, it's obvious that it, a TIF uh, can open up a development opportunity that would not otherwise be there because it would be beyond the financial capabilities of the developer. And so uh, I look forward to seeing how it is presented to us and how we all come together to try and uh, most ably represent the, rep uh, the interests of the community. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll ask for Move a approval. Move approval. Did you want to announce the date? Are you going to announce the, the date of the vote? No, not yet. Okay. I'm working with council on, uh, on uh, uh, nuances associated with the date of the election. And uh, uh, town manager Tom Hall and I have taken the view, go step by step. Make sure that we get each step right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because uh, the election laws have complexities. And we don't want to make a misstep. Uh, and so that's the reason why, we, and we're still working actively with, with our town council. We're on the phone today uh, for the better part of an hour. Uh, legal, town, council. Town legal council. Legal council. Legal council. Legal council. Legal council. Yes. With the legal council, our, yes. our attorney, uh, uh, the town clerk, town manager, and myself. It is expected it will be an action item on, on your agenda yes. next yes. Wednesday. That would be the next step in the process is to fix that date. Which would also mean that it will show up on the agenda on Friday, which is 48 <laughs> hours away. So. Move approval to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor. Third. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>